And welcome, uh, cari amici sportivi. Welcome to the local soccer show. Guys, uh, local soccer show brought to you by Evangelista. Uh, guys, the guys and girls at Evangelista, they said, Steve, we saw you two weeks ago with your guest, Mike Vitolano, and they needed to change up the wardrobe. So what they did is they provided me Canadian national jersey there that does not fit. That's not that's not their fault. That's my fault, guys. Beautiful Canadian men's national team jersey, guys. You can get that at evangelista.com, at evangelistasports.com. And, guys, they gave me the FIGC. Look at this. Look at that. I'm going to pump up my chest a bit over here. Could you see it? Could you see it? Did everybody see it? Yes, guys. That's the new... Italy FIGC winner's collection. For everybody out there, you heard me right. The new Italy FIGC winner's collection because we are i campioni d'Europa. But that's just for our friends at Evangelista Sports. Thank you to Carmelo. Thank you to Nico and Signore Sanzalone. Grazie mille. Please, guys, you can check them out, evangelistasports.com. Or you could go see them in Little Italy, 6821 Boulevard, St. Laurent. Guys, two weeks ago with Mike Vitulano, fantastic show, fantastic information. Guys, this week, we're outdoing ourselves again. He's been on the show before. We're making a return. It's his third cap, third cap for either Milan Weekly Podcast And first cap for the local soccer show. Everything grassroots, everything about player development, everything you need to know about local soccer. At least here in Montreal for the time being, we're going to expand to other provinces and other countries as the show goes on. Guys, I would like to invite back to the show returning guest from FC Laval, Mr. Sandro Grande. Sandro, how are you? Not bad, you? Very good, very good. Not bad, you? <laughs> Not bad, me? Yeah. Sandro. Yeah, what's up? Now, it's the third time on the show. We need a little <laughs> bit more than that. You have to either make fun of me, make no, fun no, of Marcello. No. I, I have nothing to say. Milan is, is in first place. Uh, Inter lost yesterday, so you guys are ecstatic. I have nothing to say. What am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in fourth place with you, man. So... So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know even, what? I'm going to tell know. you that you're right. You're right. And again, for everybody, they're saying, hey, Stevie B, Stevie P, new setup. Guys, I know here, same thing that we do on Milan Weekly Podcast, I do on the local soccer show. I do not, I do not and will never lie to the audience and people tuning in. We had some technical difficulties with the mic. President tried to help me troubleshoot. We move to the work computer with the Bluetooth headset, guys. Look at this. I can move freely. Jumping jacks, burpees, we're all good. Sandro, let's get down to it because I know uh, you've probably finished practice or you're getting off the field, and now you're giving us your time. So, Sandro, for people who don't know you, if you can tell people a little bit about Sandro Grande. Um. Born and raised in Montreal, uh, started playing soccer when I was uh, very young, like many, and um, lucky enough to be talented enough to um, to play my uh, my trade in uh, in Europe. Um, got a chance to play on the national team of Canada. Uh, had had a 13 year career uh, in Europe, North America. Was able to play in, in Champions League in North America. Played in Europa League in Italy in uh, in Europe. Um, in 2010, which was my last season, uh, played in Lithuania, and then came back. Uh, decided to start coaching because I think um, I always felt that I was I was actually coaching when I was playing as a as a center mid center midfielder. And um, since then, uh, I was with uh, Etoile de l'Est before. And um, and now just recently uh, in October signed with uh, FC Laval, um, who's a newly formed club in the west of Laval. Um, and I became technical director. 
and uh, that's it. I mean, we're uh, we're off and running. Uh, it's, a, it's an exciting project. Uh, lots of um, lots of ambition, um, and we're hoping to uh, to take this club to the next level and uh, and uh, help as many kids as possible. Um, you know, develop, love the game. If they're talented enough, get to the next level. If they're not talented enough, at least love the game and maybe coach, uh, help us grow the game, uh, help us transmit that passion to, to, to the next generation. And if we're, if we're able to do that as a, you know, as a club, as a staff, um, I think we've, uh, we're, we're going to be able to win a lot of uh, battles, you know, um, and battles not on the pitch, but like off the pitch, you know, like the, making the game bigger, making... Yes. Um, you know, bringing attention to our sport, which is a beautiful sport, and like many other sports, I think we can uh, we can coincide, we can live together, and uh, and that's it. Amazing, Sandro. One thing, you know, we've talked before, we've talked on the show, we've talked off the show. I pick your brain as much as I can, especially about local soccer. I understand Presidente has you on speed dial for any uh, drills and things that he wants to do with his little ones. And we thank you for that. And, you know, there's not a lot of people out there like you who would do that for us. Uh, one thing I would like to do, and, and everybody knows who's listened to me that weekly podcast and who knows me, I'm passionate and I love marketing and social media. And I want to tip my hat to FC Laval and their social media, their website, what they do to, to brand FC Laval as young as a club as it, as it is. It's fantastically branded. Uh, if you could give, I, I know you at FC Laval. I would be lying to everybody if I know anybody else, but there has to be someone who that we can give credit to because it's a fantastic job. Like the, the Instagram of FC Laval is not posting pictures of a little kid making pasta. It's, it, it's posting real genuine stuff. Uh, if, you, if you send out a schedule to someone, or via Instagram, or via whatever social media, it's legible. Uh, it's the full, you know, the, it's branded correctly. So who's who's in charge of branding for FC Laval, and and who can we who can give who can I tip my hat to uh, accordingly? So we have a, uh, you know, and, and this is the um, I think one of the biggest differences, and and one of the big reasons why myself and my staff right now, like we're. We're pretty excited and we're, I want to say, uh, we feel very, very comfortable because we feel like behind us, there's this, there's this massive machine um, that's, that's really, really helping us. And, you know, guys like, uh, so Jimmy Patsalibas is the, the director general. Uh, he's, he's been going out and he's uh, always out and about looking for, for money, looking for uh, sponsorships, looking for uh, ideas, uh, marketing ideas, looking for ways on how to grow our club, looking for ways on how our semi-pro is going to be fed at every game, is going to have food, is going to create an environment, a professional environment, every home game uh, that, that we host uh, for the men and for the women. Uh, he's, he's doing a lot of, a lot of that stuff um, off the field, which is fantastic because for us it makes us concentrate on, on the field. Uh, and everything that is the ball and um, and the rectangle, and um, and then you have other people like Alan Carvalho, who's uh, our our um, videographer who takes the pictures, uh, who's who's often there. First of all, he's Brazilian. Uh, he just came from from Brazil a few years ago, and uh, he actually um i don't know if you've seen or if you came across but a couple of weeks ago or maybe last week i posted a sao paulo message um yes, I from, did. A, from the head from one of the head staff guys at sao paulo and uh, this is a connection from uh, alan our uh, videographer because he he's um first of all he's a big fan of sao paulo and second of all he uh, he did he did video work for them as well so he connected us uh it was a fantastic message across the world does it mean um does it mean anything in specific? No, because I had that question. Oh, what does this mean? Is this? No, it's nothing. It's just it's 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 a beautiful message from a huge, big time superstar club to a little club in Laval. But it just shows how the our sport brings people together. I've never met the guy. He's never met me. He had beautiful words for me. I I, I returned the the message to him, and who knows? Maybe when all these restrictions, uh, you know, the, are not there anymore hop on a plane, 
maybe our staff goes to Brazil and watches watches their staff work. Uh, maybe some of our teams can go there. You know, so these are all things that make make the the the, the club really special. And then we have uh, Alan Kachuni, who's uh, who's doing a lot of the social media posts. Um, he's he's just a parent, like many other parents in 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 the in the youth sports world here. Uh, but he's very passionate. He gives he devotes a lot of time. Uh, he's a professional in in his profession. Uh, he uh, he works I think at a at a bank or he's in, he's in bank uh, bank institution. So you have this guy that's putting all his energy, posting, not asking for uh, you know I don't think he he gets paid in return. You have the videographer who's done work with a big time club in in Brazil, and um, and then you have Jimmy that works uh, behind the scenes to go and get money and all this stuff. So we really have a big big machine behind us. We have an admin staff like uh, you know like I've been in another club I know the reality of many many clubs in Quebec and we're just doing something different we're just doing something different we're we're like at the next you know I don't want to sound like a, but we're, we're, we're doing next level stuff we're doing Excellent. next level stuff and fantastic and I I needed to point that out just because it's it's really well done and it's something that sometimes gets overlooked, right? And especially, you know, uh, parents devoting their time to uh, social media and helping out the club and the club embracing the help of the parents, the help of this videographer, the help of anybody who's willing to help, you know, not shielding out the parents, not shielding out, but embracing that help and and, and having that communication. But let's get to uh, get let's get to the CDC, uh, Sandro. That's what uh, that's what everybody had. You know, my friends had questions for. You know, so after one year of, of going through this process, seeing what the CDC has done, you know, to change things up, especially for our sport in Canada, you know, what's your what's your feeling behind it? What are some things that you liked and what are some things that you disliked? Um, I think dislike is a hard word. I think it's more challenging because it's it, it is a big it is a big machine. Um one thing that's really good that we didn't have in the past, um, which is similar to other countries in, in around the world, is that um, any kid that wants to sign up for soccer now has some kind of training, has some kind of development. And that's, that's very important. It's very, very important because often we used to see in the past, you know, you, you sign up at a club. Um, if you made the competitive teams, you maybe had a decent coach. Maybe you had a parent coach that was giving his time. Um, you would have two practices a week or in a game. And then on the flip side, you had players, boys and girls that didn't make those teams. And they're being cut at early ages, at six, seven years old, eight years old. And they go and play house league soccer, recreational soccer. And they have really a parent that, um, you know, they still have a parent coach, but that devotes his time. But a lot of times in the uh, recreational um, part of it, there's there's parent coaches that never played the game, don't understand the game, um, was was hardly getting any support from from the, the technical staff or from the club. You know, um, they would sign up for the summer. It was a summer sport. Uh, they would do 12 weeks, maybe 12 games. Uh, if the coach was really devoted, he would do an extra practice a week. And, and that was their summer. They'd play, you know, they play soccer 24 times in a year uh, of an hour. And, and at the end of the year, they've done 24 hours of soccer. And then we used to ask ourselves, well, why aren't these kids developing? Well, I mean, you want to develop uh, in, in soccer, uh, you know, a decent program, a decent program at, let's say, U, U11 should be doing in and around 200 hours a year of training, you know, and um, a lot of these these kids in the past didn't have that. So now, now you go to the flip side, and now anybody can join, and everybody gets a service or is allowed to to you know is allowed to sign up to get a service. Um, so now you have kids that are you know still very very capable. There are kids that are very, very capable, very talented. And then there are kids that are lower, but, you know, they still get some kind of a service. They can still get some kind of a teacher um, to help them progress. And, you know, I don't, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think um, 
that all the kids that are down here are going to reach this level one day. I don't, I don't think that's, that's realistic to say. Uh, but will there be maybe a few more than there was in the past? I, I think so. I think so. So if in the past there would be zero, because as soon as at U8 you would, or U9 you would cut some players, you would never go look at them again. Uh, so they would never get a chance to 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 to, to join the, the competitive teams and really progress. You know, now we get to see them on a daily basis. We get to see them on a weekly basis. And if there are kids that are improving, you move them up into a training group. You know, you, you, every club should create their training groups. Um, and then as kids are progressing in their training groups, well, they can move up. And it's well, and it. If we yeah. can, there just because, uh, of course, of, of everybody, you uh, you have a ton of experience with this, especially with CDC. And I think a lot of people would like to know, like, if we go by age group, let's say we go from U4 to U7, are they, like, just playing games? Are they doing training drills? Are the games, like, three versus three, four versus four, five versus four? Like, if you could take us through, let's say, shortly, just U4 to U7, what are they doing during that path on the CDC? Oh, So U4 to U7, look. I don't think they should be training more than once a week. U4 to U6, maybe once. U7, U8, maybe twice. You know, um, It should not be soccer. So whoever thinks they're signing up their kids to soccer, it's not soccer. Now, let me, put, let me explain what I'm trying to say there. It's, it's <laughs> soccer, yes, because we're putting a ball. It looks like a soccer ball that everybody knows. We put it on the floor, and the kids get to run around and play. But at that age, it should be physical literacy. It should be phys ed. If we do phys ed with a soccer ball and hockey does phys ed with a puck and basketball does phys ed with a basketball, the kids are going to develop athletically. They're going to develop skills that they're going to need later on in life. Um, if we go there and we gear everything, soccer, 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 and no, you got to position yourself here and you got to, the kids are going to, that's where the drop off is. Kids lose motivation. They want to go there. They want to have fun. So now you got to create games. You got to create scenarios. And when I talk about scenarios, we're talking about, you know, I don't know, uh, monsters versus, uh, versus cops or uh, like anything, anything that you could think of, like, just think of phys ed. And, and the fun games that we used to play when we were small, geared towards, towards soccer, you know, with a soccer net, with a ball at their feet, and just running around. Like last week, um, our U4, U4 to U8 director, which is uh, Gennaro Angelillo, um, sent us uh, some videos of what he did with the kids. And they had the hoops, and they, they had to drag a soccer ball from one end of the field to the other end. And the only instruction was, you have this hoop, you're not allowed to touch the ball with your feet, and you're not allowed to touch the ball with your hands. You have to drag the ball to the other side. And he told me, you had kids dragging it properly. You had other kids pushing the ball. You had other kids hitting the ball for it to go to the other side. And the reality is, is that, you know, we might think, ah, oh, it's just silly. And, and, but the kids are, are finding ways on how to solve solutions. Problem so, solving. Problem solving, exactly. And this might be for soccer, but the reality is, is that they're, this exercise or this little drill, fun drill that they're doing is also helping them at school because they have to. there's a thought process behind it. When they go into school, when they go into classroom, they got to be problem solvers. They got to, okay, I got to write, I don't know, I got to write 100 words in an essay or I got I to gotta figure out what the five plus five is. How am I going to figure that out? Like, you need problem solving skills and these are developed in a in a very wide range it's not oh mathematic problem solving is one way and then soccer problem solving is another way no they're, they're kind of intertwined and everything is intertwined in life and if the kids are able to think on their own and, and be independent they're going to find the solutions you know and so fun games tag games freeze tags um anything to get the kids to run around with the ball um one of the most important skills at that age is really being able to dribble the ball from A to B and being able to do it at speed, being able to do it with your head up, being able to do it with the ball close to you, being able to do it with both feet if possible. Um, even though at four, five, six years old, you don't ask them to do it with both feet because it's, it's very hard for them. So they're going to do it always with their favorite foot, which is fine. You know, um, so that's it. A lot, a lot of, 
tie games. You wanna you wanna uh, spark their um, their interest. Their interest. Their interest. And you want, in, and you in want them soccer. to come back. Exactly. And you want them to come back. You know. So. And and Sandro, if we go on now, now we've we we've put that aside. We reach the ages of U eight, U twelve. If you could take us through what happens at this age group, where this for me, and this is just my personal opinion, we need to leave the baby stuff aside. And we need to realize and and make a, a hard decision as coaches, as parents, as people who develop, if these kids really want to continue playing soccer and want to not not, not progress, but do they enjoy the game or they're not enjoying the game at all? Look, I think I think it's uh, it's still early. U eight, U nine, U ten. You know, they're still finding a, a love for the game now. Are you gonna just do fun fun games? No, you're not. But they're still little kids, and you could still do fun games every now and then. But as long as it's it's engaging, as long as the kids are moving, as long as they're touching the ball, um, you know. Too often we see uh, youth coaches um, with a long line. For example, it, it's it's a silly example because we always use the same example. You know, six players waiting in line, and then. And then all of a sudden they're all looking in the sky and in the air and nobody's listening and well the reality is that you're probably making them way too long <laughs> these kids want to move so there still has to be that fun aspect now in my program we work on three aspects we work on 1v1s possession and games we don't do any dribbling cones we don't do any um just passing without an objective without without a defender um we don't do anything that's static they're always in movement you know now you know is there going to be a line of two three players yeah there's going to be a line of two three players which is fine you know but as long as the kid's not waiting a minute before he does uh one one drill and, and then the next you know yeah so that's what i see so the cdc their drills and i'll just give you my example we don't need to name any clubs from where i am I see that problem where there's not enough of the same station for that particular drill. Whatever the drill is, exact example, like you said, dribbling cones. It's fine dribbling cones, but if you add the element of taking a shot or finishing at the end, there's a goal to those dribbling those cones. The CDC drills, are they the same across the board or each club has the ability to modify and change and do as they wish? No, I think each club has has has, has the uh, the liberty of doing what they wish, what they believe in, you know, and how you believe soccer players are are developed. Uh, for me, we keep it simple. We keep it very very simple. So we have five teams that we work on. So not not six thousand five, and every theme in CDC um, has two different types of practices. So, for example. Week one, session one, we'll do session one A. And then we'll go through two A, three A, four A, five A, and then we'll come back and then we'll do one B, and then we'll go to B. And then once we finish the five B, we're back to one A. Okay. The five aspects that we chose to develop players are things that we believe are important for the players in our club. We kept it simple. Why? Because what happens is that you start doing the CDC then you're always looking for new sessions. You're always looking for how do we, okay, tonight, oh, we did that a few weeks ago and we did this and you keep on changing and, and like there's no direction. It becomes a little bit too much, you know? So we, we chose five um, technical, tactical themes that, that are general but also specific at the same time, uh, touch various, various aspects of the game. And when they've done 10 sessions, They've completed the cycle. They go back to session one. Now, when they get back to session one, it's their second time around. We want to see a progression. We want to see how good they can be. So, for example, last week, last Friday night, there was a 1v1 drill that we did in November. And in November, it was very difficult for them. We haven't done it since November. But when we did it Friday night, it was a million times better. They understood it. Um, so... So the first time it was getting them to understand it, getting them to go, you know, and do things, and and it was not too much coaching. The second time that I uh, that we did it Friday night, okay, now we got into some coaching points, and they were getting better. 
by the third and fourth time, by the summer, when they do that drill, they're going to be fantastic. And, and the drill is always based on soccer. So it's, it, it was a 1v1 drill that was a, a little bit more complex than, than usual 1v1s. And once they start grasping the idea behind it, they're going to become so, so much sharper. Um, and it's things that they see in a game. You know, uh, there's, it's things that they see in a game. So it's, it's, everything's relative to the game. There's 1v1 battles. So at that age, 1v1 battles is, is one of the biggest things. Um, Demolition they, Derby, I like to call it. <laughs> they, um, they, um, they're working on duels. They're working on skills, changing direction. Uh, once they start to get a hang of it, it becomes beautiful. You know, the possession drill that we did um, was just a 1v1 plus, plus support players. This week, it's a 4v2 possession type drill. And every time we're going to do this stuff, they're going to get better and better. And the instruction can get more complex. You know? Amazing. Uh, Sandra, just a question now. You're going through this. You, as technical director, oversee someone who's running this this particular practice. Is there for the? Let, I'm going to call him a technician. I'm, I apologize if that's not the term for the person who's running the the, the practice uh, or the coach of the team. But what I've seen from other other practices that I've attended to, and sometimes to myself, trying to help my friend, my uh, my son and his team, is there's always a uh, there's always a lesson learned during these drills, like a coaching point, a coaching. Uh, is that something that's healthy for the drill? Like stopping and saying, look, this is what this person did right in the drill. Everybody needs to absorb that. Or this is what this person did wrong in that drill. Everybody needs to absorb that. Um, the way I, I think, um, I think, teaching should be uh, if you have for example you do an exercise it's a 1v1 exercise and you have a 20 minutes in there i think it should be broken down into three parts or four parts and when i say broken down the way i look at it is okay you introduce yourself to the kids even though they know you 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 give them the objective of the drill or the type of drill you explain the instructions that should take a couple of minutes so now you have 18 minutes left in there if you divide it by three, uh, let's say you get to five minutes each. So we do five minute reps and we're going to have one minute in between where we talk to the kids. So the first five minutes, I'm going to go and tell you that I'm going to that what we call it and what I what the language that I'm, I'm trying to transmit to my coaches and, and what we presented them is exploration phase. So they explore. They understood the exercise. They understood the the, the, the rules. Now they get to explore the exercise. You stop it for one minute, you engage them. You engage them, you ask them questions. You ask them, they need to be their own coaches. Sandro, Stevie, anybody else, we don't have the answers. <laughs> we don't have the answers, okay? Nobody has the answers for nobody because I'm gonna look at the game one way and you're gonna look at the game the other way and the game changes picture. So just imagine there's 22 players on the field and every every fraction of a second, somebody's moving on the field. There is never one moment that's alike at all times. It's impossible. There's too many, there's too many var uh, variants. Variations, of, yeah. Var variations, uh, too many possibilities. It's endless, okay? So now you engage them, you ask them questions, you you make them come up. And, and each kid is going to have a different way of thinking of these, these answers, okay? You get them back in. Now you're in a in a phase of um, development. You know you're in a phase of okay, get in there. Now now you got to work on what you what you said you're going to do. Okay, so you explore, you develop, and then at the end you need to refine. So when you stop them after the second five minutes, again you ask them questions, and the last five minutes now you need to refine what you're what you're going to do. And in the last five minutes, if you want to stop them at one time um it needs to be quick it needs to be you know 15 20 seconds 30 seconds um it could even be just pull the kid aside that you want to talk to if he did something um that wasn't great uh or he if he did something that was good just give him a fist bump just just high five him you know and or her and and they're going to be happy you know um the important thing is that the five minute slots are really five minutes Amazing. the kids need to move yeah. if it becomes four minutes it's not enough. You you calculate five minutes, it's five minutes. <laughs> That's five it. Minutes. 
you know it's to be structured and disciplined to go through your drill like you said in in splitting it up and dissecting it the way you explained it that makes a total sense and again my questions are uh, out of curiosity as a soccer parent as someone who tries to help you know and and, and sees and, and and loves the game so a fantastic information sandro uh, thank you for that uh let's go on to the concept of the team so the, now the cdc has a concept of an open team so there's no more tryouts no closed rosters uh what are your thoughts on putting all these kids at different levels of talent and skill dr- through that same training process so i'm a firm believer that player that's a, the player that's a 10 out of 10 it's not a good idea that he trains with a player that's a one out of 10. And I'll tell you why. The one out of 10 is like taking you or me, putting us on a pitch and making us go 1v1 against Messi. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Back in the day, minus a couple of pounds, <laughs> maybe I could take the ball away from him. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> so, so is it a fair challenge? It's not a fair challenge. I'm sorry. If tomorrow morning you put me on a court and you say play 1v1 against Michael Jordan, it's not a fair challenge. No. So what what happens at that point is that you're going to have the 1 out of 10 who's going to get very, very discouraged. Very discouraged. And he might not come back. Maybe. Because the, the challenge is way too much. Okay? And the 10 out of 10, he might be bored because the challenge is way too easy. And then what happens is when the when the, the challenge is too easy, the, the the kids work less. Okay. Now, I believe in in finding there's there's a there's a, um, a theory called um, being in the in the learning uh, in the learning flow. Okay. And basically, you got to find that 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 part where the challenge is not too high, where it becomes discouraging, and the challenge is not too low, where it becomes boring. It's got to be right in the middle. And those two players, the 10 out of 10, or even the 8 out of 10, I'm not going to say 10 out of 10 because we probably don't have any 10 out of 10s in, 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 uh, in our uh, reality. But the 8 out of 10 and the 1 out of 10 need to be in their own learning flow. And the learning flow could be, today I give you a, a, a math equation and I say, what's 1 plus 1? And after a few days, you've understood it. Okay, let's go to 1 plus 2 now. I'm not going to go from one plus one to 100 plus 100, right? You, it's, it's too much of a jump. So you need to go get there gradually. You do want to get there, and all kids will get there, okay? Um, some of them might never get there, right? But the one that's a 10 out of 10 um, needs to be able to be challenged. So he can progress a little bit, a little fraction. And the next day, he progresses a little fraction, you know? Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, well, if, if any of, you, of your viewers know, but uh, Matthew Caravolo, uh, exit to Alvarez player, just signed with uh, Valor and uh, CPL. And, yes. and we had a partnership with my old club uh, with Juventus Academy. And when Juventus Academy came, the coaches came. These were actual Ju- Juventus Academy coaches. Um, I asked them that week, I said, listen, please have a look at this player because he's very special. And I think he's got something like above, above the rest. And uh, I think he was 12 or 13 years old at that time. And um, they looked at him all week and they said, yeah, he's a fantastic player. He said, but in, in Juve, they're all like him. Here, when he does a 1v1 drill, most of the times, 80% and up, he, he's able to win the, the battle fairly easily. And it's, the, the challenge is not high enough for him. In, in Juve, the, the 15, 16 players that we have of his age, they're all 9 out of 10s, 8 out of 10s, and 10 out of 10s. So every time they, 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 they do a 1v1 battle, they progress maybe 0.75. But Matthew, at Etoile de l'Est, was maybe progressing... Point twenty five because the challenge was not big enough for him. Was not difficult yeah. enough for him. You know, so he might have like you. You take that same boy from Laval and you put him 
born and raised in Torino, and he's probably with the Juve squad because he's going to be progressing at that rate every week, week in, week out, session after session. You know, it's the continuous challenge of of, of always being against people that are that eight, nine out of ten. One hundred percent. Sandro, would you say it's harder to get that one out of ten player to be an eight out of ten player, or that eight out of ten player keeping him at eight out of ten, or maybe going to nine? I think it's it's uh, both of them are hard. The, the challenge with the one out of ten is that many of them, and I see it more and more. Um, Many of them, unfortunately, lack the motivation to 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 be there, to want to learn. Um, a lot of them maybe might still have that mentality of recreational soccer of the past, you know. Um, and then there are those ones and twos and threes out of ten that really want to try and learn. Um, and the reality is, is that we're playing a sport. You need to be somewhat athletically not gifted, but able. You know, your motor skills need to be need to be need to be sharp. And some kids, um, you know, just don't have the coordination. Speak you know? freely, Sandro. Speak freely. It, it's it, it, it's it's something that this generation needs a little bit more of. People like yourself who speak freely. Some But, people just don't have it. Yes, yeah, so some people just don't have it. I mean, that's that's the that's the reality. I mean, look. In Italy, if you go into a scuola calcio, everybody gets taught. At around eight, nine years old, there are players that are going to go to AS Roma and Lazio. And there are players that are going to go to the local club across the street in Rome. Now, the local club across the street in Rome... Spenzano all... Piccolo FC. <laughs> so the, the little club across the street has all players of three out of ten. They don't have the ten out of ten. The ten out of ten is already at Roma. And he's at Lazio. And he's at uh, AC Milan and and so on, right? So those kids are training at their own pace, at their own rhythm. And slowly, slowly, they get, they're going to get there, you know? Um, I mean, it's we, we need to be honest with, like, you know, I have two brothers. I mean, uh, one of them played soccer until he was maybe 16, 17, and then stopped. The other one played until he was, you know, a little bit older, uh, but never played pro. And we all come from the same parents the reality is that we don't have the same skills like that's just what it is you know but we need to have this sort of program because there are those kids that progress i have a boy um who's in who's at fc laval now who's uh, who was at uh, my old club as well um who at u8 i remember i put him in division two at u9 i brought him back to division one uh, not back because it was the second year so i brought him to division one At U10, I put him back in Division II. At U11, we put him back in Division I. And slowly, slowly, he's progressed. And he was so-so. He was, he was getting better. But he had, he had the volia. He had, he had really the will to be there. He loved the game. He got better and better and better. You see him today, you're like, oh, my gosh. This is this the same kid? You know? So there are those, those, those examples of kids that just need a bit more time. And something needs to click. You know, um, and and look, if if we're gonna hide behind, oh, I can't tell Steve that his son is a four out of ten. Well, then you're not a professional coach. And you're also <laughs> doing, and you're also doing the player and his parents a disservice. Of course. So me, the way I am, I'm honest with ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the parents, and I tell them straight, this is what it is. Some of them don't like it. But the reality is that they don't like it at the beginning because they feel hurt. But eventually they start to realize, you know what? He was right. Some of them appreciate it, appreciate the honesty. And the moment, like when I first got to FC Laval, we did tryouts uh, in October for the older teams. And I told the coaches, I'm new here. We're gonna, I'm going to select players based on what I'm seeing. But throughout the winter, and, and when the winter started, there was a lot of, you know, uh, pushback and, and the questioning and all this stuff. And I told the guys, I said, uh, all the staff that was there, the old staff and some parents that, that asked me, and I said, listen, your kid, all he needs to do is work hard. And if we made a mistake, we're definitely going to open the door to bring him back up or she back up. And that's what we did. Then once the winter started and, and a month later, I'm like, I'm at the field or my assistants are at the field. And I'm like, Sandro, I think we made a mistake on this guy. And I think we made, 
no problem, bring him up. It's not an issue. It's not an issue at all. Zero. You know, if, if, and I tell the kids all the time, you're disappointed. Good. Be angry at me, but use the anger to spin it. Prove me wrong. And I have no problem to push you back up. No problem. You know, why, why, why would I have an issue with that? I'm, I'm being a professional. My son plays in the club. There's no, there's no favoritism. No. <laughs> there's no and, favoritism. And, that, and that's something that you touched on, you know, that I would like to highlight. And some people get caught in that moment where, you know, sometimes taking a step back lets you take two steps front later on, you know, and especially in someone, you know, as young as your son and you could do it towards your son. And, you know, I would do it towards, I, I'm honestly speaking here, I would do it towards my son. What's what's a bit challenging for me is, you know, at a certain point, the parent needs to understand that this is, this. you know, you're the professional. They are not the professional. Like if I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me, Steve, you have high blood pressure. I have to take that. I might not be happy about it, but he's the doctor and he just told me I have high blood pressure. I'm going to be pissed and I'm going to take that anger and I'm going to try to work at it so I can lower this high blood pressure. Same thing as a mechanic. You go to the mechanic, you have a problem with your car. He is the mechanic. He is the doctor. You are the technical director. This is what frustrates me with local soccer. Because I see it time and time again where, you know, there's a child or a kid who should not be in a particular team and is just because of favoritism and so on and so forth. We, we're never going to get rid of that. But it, it's an important point that all parents should, should remember and keep in the back of their mind. You guys are the professionals and you're doing it for a good reason. Yeah, I mean... Look, if we're not going to get to that point where we can be honest with everybody and, you know, we can start bringing the game to a professional level, like in our club right now, in our CDC, U9 to U12. So first of all, U4 to U8, we have Gennaro Angelillo, I said it before, he has an A license. Okay. So the director of our U4 to U8 has an A license. That's not, that's not a joke. No. That's, that's big time. Okay. And... To his credit, he loves going to the field with those little kids and just rolling around with them. And he loves it. He loves it. Now, he also, uh, myself and him, also coach an older team together. But he enjoys it. He calls me, oh, you have to see those kids. He sends us little videos. This week, you're probably going to see some of the videos coming out on, on Instagram because uh, he, he filmed some of them. But the little kids, and, and he loves it. He loves it. Hats off. Hats off yeah. because if we don't have people like that in the game, we're, in trouble. We're never going to progress. So you have that. U9 to U12, you have myself that played internationally. You have George Transales that played in first division in Greece, coached first division in Greece, who is a UEFA pro license. He Not left Greece because of... <laughs> what's that? Not a joke. <laughs> Not a joke. So he was coaching four years ago, five years ago, with packed stadiums in Greece. And the only reason he left was because of the um, financial issues that they're, they're having in Greece and all that stuff at that time. He left. He came to Canada for a better life. He was coaching in first division. He coaches now in our U9 to U12. Every Monday night, myself and George are at futsal. Every Wednesday night, myself and George and others are at futsal. Every Friday night, myself and George are on the, on the pitch with the kids. And every Saturday, they're on, we're on the pitch with the kids. And the, the, the biggest thing in all this is that we're walking around helping coaches. When we see a kid, we'll take him aside. We'll give him some. We'll give him a bit of feedback. Those kids don't even know who I am. They don't even know who George is. And we don't care. We don't need to tell them exactly. who we are. We don't need to tell them who we are. Like, it's just that's the environment that the kids need. That's why in Europe, they're so much better than us because at U9 and U10 and U11 and U12 and so on and forth, so forth, they have pros coaching them in every age group. Ajax in, um, I don't remember which age group, Patrick Clivert 
coaches one of their teams. Um, the, 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 the director is Van der Sar. <laughs> uh, like, it, it's crazy. The, the coaches that are coaching in, 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 like for us, for me, I look at that, uh, Patrick Leiter, he's coaching a youth team. Yeah, he's coaching a youth team. Mm-hmm. How much better can those kids get, you know? Um, and, and that's what we need more of in, 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 uh, in Canada, you know? And too many people, uh, you know, and I see these, the, the same thing, the same thing with coaches sometimes. You know, oh yeah, but I have, I have a DP, I have an ESP. I need to coach triple A, but why don't you help us with U9 to U12? Triple A is very, very hard. Triple A players need a lot of information yes. that many triple A coaches that think they're triple A coaches are not can't give. They can't give them that 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 those that information that they need. So come and help us with the little kids. Come and help us with the U9 to U12. Come and help us with the 13 year olds, 14 year olds. You know, I, I hear I hear it all the time. Oh, oh yeah, but I'm better coaching older players. No, you're better coaching older players because you don't want to coach young players because the young players it takes it takes it takes time and energy to 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 figure out how to, how to teach them. So the older players, you you give them the exercise, they figure out on their own, and uh, and you and you you walk off the pitch. But they've did they've done everything. You haven't done anything, you know. You're just looking for shortcuts, you know. So there's 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 a lot of challenges. Uh, the CDC opens the doors to everybody. But what's important is that when there's a player that is progressing, reward them. When there's a player that's regressing, teach him a lesson or her a lesson, and put them down a level of group. Yeah. Those and when, are, those when are, all those the parents are start to accept that, yeah. and all the clubs are doing it, when all the clubs are doing it, we're going to start progressing. Because now I'm going to tell the Steve, Steve, you're going down a level. You were in group one, now you're going to be in group two for the next month. Prove to me wrong. If Steve doesn't prove to me wrong and he says, well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to club ABC and I'm going to be in the top group and they're going to give me the captain badge, well, the other club is not doing this kid a favor. Again, another disservice just to just to get someone uh, someone on their team. Exactly, and that's a good point. I wanted to to touch on something. So you saw, I see all the time, and I'm not picking on any particular club. You can say, Steve, I can't. I'm not going to answer this. Vinny Gattuso saying hi. I hope he's watching with his beautiful daughter Ariana. Fantastic little girl soccer player. Amazing. Uh, amazing to see his videos of her and what he does. Vinny does a lot for uh, for for his girls and uh, proud that he's my oh, friend. Oh, hold on, hold on. Somebody job. wants to. Why not? That's the soccer. Why not? <laughs> they said why not. Why not? <laughs> so I see a lot of partnerships. You know, you mentioned you know the videographer sending you a. a, a you know, a video from, who was it again? It was Palmeiras? Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Yeah. You, you mentioned a partnership with uh, Juventus. I, I know other clubs that have partnerships with other with other teams abroad. What about partnerships with other clubs in the city? Do they share information? Do you guys get together with other clubs and obviously, look, Sandra, I know the clubs are competing for subscriptions and so on and so forth. But information sharing between the clubs in Montreal, does that happen? It happens with you me. Could say, you, you could say, <laughs> Steve, I don't want to answer the question. It's fine. It happens with me. It happens with guys like Andrea Di Petrantonio. It happens with guys coach, like... Coach, the coach. I got to get him on the show, the coach. He's going to be really mad when he sees this one. <laughs> guys like Mike, guys like Kit... You know, guys like uh, the the guys that are really in it for the game share. Okay. Like at my old club, we had our technical program, and I wanted to put it on our website, and they're like, "No, we can't put it on the website. They they're, they're going to copy it." I said, "But who's going to copy it?" Yeah, the other clubs are going to copy it. I said, "If if if another technical director in the province goes on our website." and copy Sandro Grande's philosophy, instead of going on Google and doing an, a search on AC Milan's philosophy, Ajax's philosophy, Barcelona's philosophy, taking $500 out of his pocket and doing the Barcelona online course, Academy Coach, if they're going to come and copy mine, first of all, I'm going to be happy. And second of all, 
they're making a mistake because they can go and find anything on Google right now. You can go find any any programs. There's so much information out there. So I'm like, and what's the problem if they copy it? They're going to produce players like we're producing players. The the thing I like to to, to say the most uh, to to the to the clubs that I worked with or or whatever, I, I, I like to tell them like, guys, I'm I'm not here for for your club only. I'm here for the players. Everything has to be here for the players. We're all in it for the Canadian national team. If we're all in it for the Canadian national team, whether I wear FC Laval or I wear another club's logo, it shouldn't be an issue. We should all work in unison. We should all work together. And we should all try to develop players as much as possible together, join forces, and make sure our national team qualifies to the World Cup every year. Every year. That's the only way the game is going to get better here. Because as soon as you qualify for a World Cup, and we're going to qualify for this one, and we're going to qualify for the 2026. So it's, we're going to do two, two World Cups in a row. That's going to be a lot of money coming into the country. Sponsorships, um, TV deals. Um, that's going to be a lot, a lot of money. And more money Exposure. comes in. Exposure. Exposure and more money comes in, better the CPL becomes, better the MLS becomes, better the youth clubs become. It all trickles down. If we only look at our little pie, I'm in the west of Laval, I'm with FC Laval. I only look at FC Laval, well, then we might not get better as a nation. And if we don't get better as a nation, FC Laval is only going to be able to take it to a certain point. Like St. Leonard or like RDP or like Mo, not Monte, but AS Laval or, or any other clubs, you know, we're only going to be able to take it to a certain point because we're, we're community clubs. We're limited. We need the help of CSA. We need the help of Soccer Quebec. We need the help of sponsorships, companies, investors. We need the help of all these people to, to first so that FC Laval one day has a, some kind of a stadium. Government, government. Government as well. Government as well. No, you know, and, and it's great there that you brought up the Canadian men. We're going to take some some questions. We have some questions that came in there. So uh, I know it's already uh, 55 minutes. I'm pretty sure we could talk uh, another hour and 55 minutes. So <laughs> in, in respect for your time, I want to go to these questions. So I got a question from Francis Giacomo. You know that he was going to chime in. And, you know, of his course. question was going to be hard. So... Our, his question is again regarding you know CDC and you know these uh, fans the, the, you know the different licensing you know national license uh, provincial license so on and so forth. His question hits hits home, and he, his question is: Are you concerned that we have or are creating super associations where players would want to transfer to? instead of staying in their home county or region so this is um it's 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 a big one this one because look i was part of a club for 10 years and uh we had many triple a teams and the statistics on joueur muté so players new players that came into the club we were one of the lowest percentages of new players we had new players I'm not going to say we had all players that were born and raised in, in, in my club. It's not true. We had players that came from abroad, that came from outside. Um, but with regards to the greater Montreal area, we were one of the clubs with the lowest percentage of, of Joueur Mite. Okay. Um, I'm of the belief of this. Before you go on, it's yeah. I find it's a really strange name, Mute. <laughs> yeah. Like, couldn't they pick another name? Like uh, every time I hear that, I, I I cringe. I'm sorry. I had to just throw that in. Maybe someone's gonna hear it and we'll change the name. I told Mike Vitolano the other day. Could someone change Mutate? Because it's like a weird, it's like a weird <laughs> name. Sorry, Sandra. Go on. I I agree. So, um, so here here's the thing. Um, if your club has a good program, um, you should stay where you are. Now, if the club that you want to go to is next door and your club doesn't have a good program, well, then you should move. It should be freedom of movement. The, the issue that we have, and this comes back a little bit to what I said before, is clubs do it on purpose to go and solicit players. So 
for example, you have uh, you have a, a, a team in, in an age group of 16, 17, 18 players. Okay, you have about 10 good players, you have about four decent players, and you have about three or four average players. Nobody wants to work with those average players. No, we got to go get uh, three more top players. So we need to be 13 top players and four av uh, medium players or, or decent players. Sorry. And then uh, the year after that, oh, no, no, we got to get rid of those four and we got to go get to. OK, but then w when do you stop? When do you start? When do you start developing? When do you start using the players that you have in your in, like these are massive clubs in, in Italy? And in France and in other places, the clubs are 150 players, 200 players. They're not. They're not 4,000 players. We have 4,000 players. If you can't develop 20 players per age group to play in AAA or you know whatever the league, whatever are. category, yeah. And and another 20 to play in your second tier teams. It's an issue now. If a player comes and knock on your door and you and he says, Well, I want to come to your club, okay, come. Come. I had players in my old club that wanted to come from Longueuil and Saint Subert. And I said, Well, you're not coming to and I knew these kids. I said, No, you're not coming all the way down here. We're in Laval. Yeah, yeah, I need I need to come. Uh, uh, the, the the club I'm with is not doing a good job. Yeah, but you gotta cross two bridges before you get to me. You know what kind of lifestyle you're gonna have? Like, go find yourself a club that's close to you. It, it, it can't be that bad, you know? And I knew the club that the kid was at. The two kids, actually, two kids. They were at a decent club in the South Shore. And they wanted to move. And I'm like, why? Why? It's, it's not It's not just justified that you want to take two bridges to come to practice three times a week or four times a week. And then you want to play the game on the weekend. And you're going to have to travel again. So it's four times a week. You're going to have to travel two bridges. To come to practice and, and play, it's yeah, it's not that's, that's not it's not feasible. It's not feasible. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for a family. It's not healthy for the for the kid, you know. Like, uh, so now if kids want to move and they, they you know they're not happy where they are, move. Like it's 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 not an issue. But the the, the other to tack on to that, and you said four thousand kids. Do you think? associations are becoming too big i do i do it and and i've i've been saying this uh, to a few people i've i have like a, a, an idea on how it could be maybe restructured you know so u4 to u i don't know u4 to u10 could maybe just be like the city that you're in so for example we're in we're in the west of laval the West of Laval has a community service, okay? And it has a different logo. The, maybe it doesn't have FC Laval. It has Laval West, community soccer. Maybe it's still La, uh, FC Laval staff that, do, that gives the service, that helps them out. But it's kind of like subcontract, okay? When they get to 11, they come and they knock on the FC Laval's door. I want to be in your teams because FC Laval becomes the elite club becomes the club where I can progress I'm progressing to something you know the parent club the parent club the the, the players that get in there um, maybe it's just you know the top players and the second tier players and now you've reduced the workload on 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 the staff now you can give better service whoever doesn't get into that those two two first levels maybe still play in a community club environment you know you're creating kind of like a pyramid where the kid says okay i'm at uh, laval west community soccer I'm, I'm there for six seven years and then i want to progress to go play with fc laval it gives them a motivation when they come to fc laval they're not mixing mentalities in the sense that right now a u4 player um when he gets to u10 he still sees me or his technical staff or the logo as the same people that he had six, seven years ago. But now all of a sudden we want them to be serious. And it's hard to change that message, change that mentality of that seriousness. But if you have it the other way, when they come and knock on the FC Laval door, 
a little bit like they do in hockey. When they go to a midget AAA team, they're not in the same club. It's a totally different club. When they go to Junior Major, it's a totally different club. But everybody's knocking on that door to get into that club. So it creates uh, supply and demand, you know. And when they come and knock on the door at 11 years old, well, you can put rules down, you know, certain things that you want to do in your club for the, for the boys and girls to be serious. And now they're going to have to abide by those by, by those by that program, you know, be there on time, be there half an hour early, you know. You're, you're creating a culture. Exactly. Exactly. And never leaving, never putting aside the Laval Community uh, Club because you're still going to go see them. You're still going to go. I guess the workload would be the same. Just the mentality would shift maybe. And at 11 years old, now you're going to see the kids really, okay, I want to get there. That's where I want to be. Some people are always saying, what am I going to do? I'm not going to have as many subscriptions as I had before, Sandro. How am I going to afford this, Sandro? You're going to have the same amount of subscriptions because whoever signs up to the to the Laval soccer community, um, the you know, the half of the budget or whatever budget you need is still going to it's still going to be shared with FC Laval. Look, the, the reality, the reality is, is that soccer costs money. Sports cost money. We don't live in Europe where the government gives a whole bunch of money and we don't live in Europe where Steve, he shows up at the door and he, he, he lays down $5 million on the table to run a, a soccer academy. We don't have that. No. So the parents have to pay. And if the parents have to pay and they're getting 200 hours a year, 230 hours a year, 240 hours a year, $10 an hour for any type of service is, it is what it is. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? And now if there's players that can't afford it, you find ways, you find ways, you find, you find sponsorships, you find, you build funds, you, you, um, there, there's many, you know, there's the, uh, CLSC fund, there's the Canadian tire fund. There's, there's many ways of going to find money for, for the people that need it, you know? Yeah. Um, no, and again, it's not, not again, my question is a bit loaded just because you know that that question would come up, right? Even whatever scenario you would come up of with. Course. I'm not saying, again, respect your, your, your soccer knowledge. You, you may be right, you may be wrong, but it's always going to come down to the money, and that's the thing that bothers me the most. Because I said it to Mike Vitulano too, uh, you know, we need the government. We need the government to pay attention to soccer just as much as they want to pay attention to hockey. Hockey, there's a big crisis, Sandro. The Montreal Canadiens don't have any Quebec-born players. What do we do, Sandro? What do we do? So the province gets behind the hockey. Someone needs to have the testicular fortitude, and it might be Stevie P, to say, hey, buddy, have you ever looked at the subscriptions to soccer? Because they're much more than the subscriptions to hockey. And not taking away anything from hockey. But I'm saying, unfortunately, we live in a, in a country that's hockey dominated all the time. It's always about hockey. It's hockey, hockey, hockey. But now to switch to something a little bit more enjoyable and more positive, you see what's happening with the Canadian national team. Yourself, someone who's played with the Canadian national team, the provinces, and I'm not saying just Quebec, I'm saying across the board, need to understand that, hey, from BC to Newfoundland, we need to start paying attention to soccer now because we're getting on that, like you said, we're, we're getting on that world stage. 1983 is a long time ago. A real long, 1986, sorry, is a real long time ago. 2022 is now and present. Let's forget about the long time ago and let's look at what these people are doing now. And, you know, the Canadian Soccer Association needs to, needs to man up a bit too. They did it with the Olympics. We had a problem with the Olympics. We needed to get, they started a podium program. There should be some sort of soccer program now to get some funds into these local clubs where we could reduce the cost for the parents. We could pay people like you adequately for the services that you, you that you give. And also 
you know, volunteer parents and get in for a time. Anyways, that's my idea. But let's go back to the Canadian national team because I don't want to end with with this, you know, always talking about the money and the negativity of it. But that's just my uh, soapbox speech to the to, to the premier uh, and anybody else who's going to watch this and wants to spread the local soccer show news. Sandro, tell me, you know, as someone who's played for a national team, how you've been, you know, what's that feeling for you seeing the success of the Canadian national team now? Uh, look, it's... Uh... It's fantastic. I mean, um, first of all, they're playing a brand of soccer that's uh, very nice to watch. It's exciting. Um, you have young kids, you know, my son and a lot of their friends starting to watch. They know the players. Um, it's a great it's a great day to be a, a soccer um, ex not expert, but professional in, in this country as a coach or whatever, as a technical director. It's, 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 uh, it's really a moment where uh, we can really launch this thing like really, really far. And um, I was skeptical for, you know, they weren't supposed to be in the, um, in the last phase of the World Cup qualifying. They got in luckily uh, because uh, they changed uh, some of the rules. It used to be six teams only. And then they put eight teams because of COVID and all this stuff. And uh, so they were lucky enough to get in. And then since they've been in, all they've done is game after game has been exciting. Um, I do think it's it's destiny. Like uh, I think the last three or four games, uh, they were up 1-0. And, and Borian makes an incredible save to keep it at 1-0. And then they end up scoring a 2-0 goal uh, right after or, or soon after. Uh, the goal from Matiba in um, in El Salvador was was funny to say the least, you know. Yes. And and I've never seen a goal like that ever. I will probably will never see another goal. Like uh, yeah, that. exactly. You know, so so destiny is on their side, um, but I just hope, like you said before, I hope that we use this wave to to really really give the sport the the exposure that it it needs. And that we need to keep we need to keep the momentum going. Like now, there's no excuse, right? Exactly. In the past, it was always, you know what? But Canada doesn't succeed at international level, and we we can't or whatever excuse the higher ups wanted to find. Now there's no excuse anymore. 1986, 2022 is a very long time for everybody. I would I am not going to lie to anybody. I'm going to age myself. I have absolutely no idea what happened in 1986. No idea, but I do know what's happening in 2022 at 40, soon to be 41 years old, and this needs to continue. The momentum needs to continue. What? Two more questions, and I make you go to bed or have a, 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 piccolo, a, a little bit of uh, latte caldo with a little biscotto, whatever you have before you go to bed. <laughs> Sandro, a question coming in. Uh, what pathway would you recommend for a Canadian kid who is 18 and wants to pursue a career as a professional? Does he go to the CPL, look to countries like Italy and Spain, or another another path? Look, there's no one pathway. Uh, what makes Europe and the world game beautiful is that there's many pathways. Pathways. I went to Italy. I went to try out with Pescara in second division when I was 18, made the Primavera team, and the coach told me straight, you have one year to play here. What's the point? Go play in Interregionale in Serie D or go play in Serie C. Went to try out in Serie C, didn't make it in the first team of Lumezzane, and ended up playing uh, in Serie D for a couple of years. Everything is connected from Serie D to Serie C to Serie B to Serie A. Everything is connected. Um, that's the way you need to think about the game. Uh, too many people here think I'm going to go to Italy and I'm going to play in first division. Uh, good luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, good luck. And let me know how that works out for you because it's not, it's going to be very, very hard and almost impossible. Okay. So you need to start low. Um, you need to get on a path that's going to allow you to get on that path. Now, if it's NCAA and you think you could do more, Give it a shot. If you can't do more and your only path is NCAA, go to NCAA and try to do your best. 
try to play, try to be in an environment that's going to be competitive, that's going to be very difficult to, to succeed in. Get there, perform, win your spot, win your minutes. Um, you're, you're, you're a really talented player. You're able to play right away in CPL, go play CPL. You're able to go and play in MLS, try out, try out. It's not an issue. But the reality is, is that if the doors are closed to play in MLS because you come from, I don't know, you come from my club and MLS already, you know, CF Montreal has tons of players and they have an academy and it's, it's hard for you to get in. Well, that door might be closed for you right now, but it's going to open in the future if you do the right things at a CPL club in Halifax. Let's, let's, uh, let's be honest with everybody. If you're that good, they're going to come and find you, whichever path you take. They're, they're going to look for, to you at the NCAA level, and they're going to find you because I'm pretty sure MLS teams, CPL teams, they'll send their scouts to go watch certain games or video, however they can watch that, right? So, uh, And I agree with that, right? We have to be realistic and realist. I, I, I like to be real. You know, on, on Milan Weekly Podcast every Monday night, you know, 9 p.m., we go live. I'm real. I'm real with my team. I'm real with my expectations. I'm trying to do that and pass that on to anybody that I talk to. I manage my expectations. And I think young kids at 18 years old, it's a combination of managing your expectations yourself as now you're a man. You're 18 years old. But some people need to, you know, they need people like you to give them that extra advice. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it's exactly that. It's managing your expectations. Like you're not going to go to Europe and you're not going to play in first division unless, like everybody talks about, yeah, but Alfonso Davies did it. Okay, but Alfonso Davies was with Vancouver Whitecaps. Yeah. And at 17 in MLS was dominating the whole MLS. Don't, don't tell me Alfonso Davies. Alfonso Davies was in an academy in Edmonton. Went to the Academy of Vancouver at, uh, I think, 13 or 14 years old. At 17, was already playing in the first team and scoring goals. So he was already in a pro game. Yes, he's able to go to Bayern Munich because they saw him play at the adult level and dominating. So He's in that, that less than down. 1%. He's in that less than 1%. Yeah. You know, like, look at myself. I had a scholarship in the U.S. I didn't go to the U.S. I decided not to go. A couple of weeks before I had to leave, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Italy. I don't want to go to the U.S. I want to go to Italy. And I left. And I went to Italy. I was willing to risk it. Petrus Bernier went to Syracuse. Paul Stalteri went to Clemson. Olivier Ossian went to another school. I don't remember the school. Now. I'm, uh, I drew a blank there. But he went to another school in the, in the U.S. They all went to NCAA. They all played in Europe. I mean, uh, Paul Stalteri won, won the Bundesliga and played in Champions League with Werder Bremen. Played in Tottenham. Uh, not Tottenham, Fulham, I think, or Tottenham, I'm not sure. Uh, so you had Patrice that played in the Bundesliga, you had Patrice that played in Denmark. Like, So there's no one pathway, you know? And if you just say that you give up and you're going to go play, and the reality is that you might just play with a USL team for 10 years. And if you're fine with that, that's good. That's good. <laughs> you know, like, not everybody's going to play with, you know, AC Milan or... Hardly anybody's like people have to understand you're coming from Canada. Like with all due respect to, to all Canadian soccer players, myself included, like we're, we're just, we don't have the level that the, the Brazilians have and the Argen Argentinians have and the, the kids from Cote d'Ivoire have and the kids from Senegal have. We don't have that level. These guys, AC Milan is going all over the world to pick the best Japanese, the best Brazilian, the best Argentinian and the best Chilean to, 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 to build their team, you know? So you have to understand the, 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 the uphill battle. Yeah. It's not impossible. Kyle Lahren is playing in Basiktas. Atiba Hutch is playing in Basiktas. Uh, Jonathan David is top scorer in France. Uh, Alfonso Davies is, is with Bayern Munich. It's not impossible. It's very possible. But you just got to go one step at a time. You're not going to be able to skip levels. You know? One step at a time. That's important. Last question for you. Sandro, you're, you're a coach. You're a technical director. You're a student of the game. Very knowledgeable. In your opinion, who has the greatest soccer mind? Klopp, Conte, Mourinho, or Tony Marinero? <laughs> 
Tony Marinaro, definitely. Tony Marinaro. <laughs> Shout out to Tony, whatever you're doing. Tony, we're going to need to get you on, Tony. I have an idea for us. So, yeah. Sandro, an hour and 15 minutes flew by. I want to thank you very, very much to, uh, for being on the local soccer show. Uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about. So is Marcello. It's a bi-weekly episode, guys. Please share this with your clubs. Share this. You know, you know. this week it was about FC Laval and picking San, the great Sandro Grande's brain. Next week we could have someone from another club. This is not to compare clubs, not to compare techniques. It's just to share information with, you know, soccer dads, soccer people who are interested, people who are, you know, newly bringing their kids into local soccer, people who already have their kids in local soccer. Please, guys, share the, the share the show. It's very important to us. We want to continue this. We want to we want to make sure that it's successful and continue to have great guests uh, like Sandro. Sandro, please uh, give everybody a, a little bit of uh, you know where they can see you and where they can come and register uh, for uh, FC Laval. Look, FC Laval, uh, we're all over Instagram. So in our Instagram page is, is fantastic. Uh, my Instagram page has been uh, has been really really good in, in the last few months. Um, uh, they can they can reach me at my email address uh, sandro.grande at uh, fclaval.com. Um, registrations are on our website fclaval.com. Um, I just want to say, Steve, like um, for all the people that have questions and want to pick my brain or they want to come and see a practice and they want to see what we do on the field and it has nothing to do with changing clubs just to see i want to come and see you're invited whenever you want come and have a look come and stand next to me on the field come and stand next to george no no i can't stand next to you guys God. <laughs> it's going to ruin your it's going to ruin your reputation there who's this large who's this large person next to sandro <laughs> Why did think you're an train agent. him? Why <laughs> didn't he train him? <laughs> They're gonna think you're an agent. Oh, that's that would be funny. That would be good. Yeah. I could make that happen. Yeah. So I'm open. I want to share documents. I share documents with people all over the world on my WhatsApp, on Telegram, on all this stuff. Like I have so many groups going. It's I coaches I've never met. We're 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 chatting because we have a link to another coach and they share documents. We share documents. My phone blows up every day, like how many texts I get and all that stuff. People want to know what we're doing, want to know what I believe in the, with regards to the game. You want to have a coffee? Let's go to have a coffee. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll invite you to the field. You'll come and see. The door is open. We had Barcelona, David Sanchez, uh, two months ago, come to run a, uh, a session at the club. I never met him before in my life. We, we talked for four or five hours straight on football. Um, and this is a guy from Spain who, who was in one of the biggest youth development structures in the world. Um, and he was willing to have a conversation with me. That's the game. Yeah. The, the people that have an issue with that in, in, in our country, you're not helping the game. We need to get together. We need to sit down at a table. We need to figure out how is this going to get better? How is this going to get better? You have a great idea? No problem. Let me know about it. And I'll give you my opinion. You know, Excellent. and... and I think I think that's the only way we're gonna we're gonna get better if we all think about the kids first and not did did I win the game against Steve Saturday? Who cares? Yeah. Like okay, Steve won by one goal or five goals. Good job, Steve. You're doing a really good job of development. Well done. Yeah. Hats off. You know, like there's there's no issues. You know. Sandro, again, thank you very much, guys. I can't sign off without thanking again uh, Evangelista Sports, Carmelo, Nico, Signore Sanzalore. Please, guys, check out. Beautiful. In this corner here, I'm very terrible with this. Canadian men's national team jersey. Guys, it's a, it's a fantastic. Uh, it's hanging there just because I need to shed some pounds to fit into that. And, uh, guys, this beautiful uh, Italy, the winner's collection, because we are Campione d'Europa, and we're, guys, we're going to make the World Cup. We're going to make, I'm convinced we're going to make the World Cup. So, Who's going to be our striker? I have no idea. We'll talk about that when I come to the field because we might need to pick someone from FC Laval. But, uh, guys, again, check out Evangelista 
sports.com for any online orders guys if you're in montreal go check them out they have some other stores around the island as well but the head and the mecca of soccer in montreal is little italy 6821 boulevard saint lara sandro again i thank you very very much i love talking soccer with you you know we have we got to do this off camera so we can actually say the truth about the things that i really want to talk about And I'm pretty sure President has his own things that he wants to bring up. Uh, it's two years that we said we wanted to get together. The three of us, we will do it. COVID restrictions are going to go away. Again, Sandro, thank you very much. Thank you what what you do for local soccer. And I hope to have you on again in the future. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for the opportunity. Presidente, wrap it up. Let's go.